All right, so let's take a look at the nitrogen cycle. And it's arguably the most complex of the cycles. Uh, don't be intimidated by what you're seeing here. Um, I just went ahead and pre-labeled everything instead of pulling it up one at a time. And there are some major points that I want to make here. And I've done the same thing here that I did with the other uh, biogeochemical cycles, the water cycle and the, the carbon cycle that we've already gone over, um, labeled what is what part of the cycle involves life and what part of the cycle involves geo, so geo and bio. Um, and you can see that it's pretty evenly split between the two. Um, and so nitrogen, well, the first points to make, I, and I want to bring up the, the major points first so that we, uh, so that you can understand the importance of those as we go through the cycle here. And the first one is that nitrogen, and especially in the form of nitrate, which is NO3 minus here in the diagram, um, is a limiting nutrient for photosynthetic organisms, all photosynthetic organisms. And an example of that is the importance of nitrogen in DNA and protein. If you'll recall, DNA contains uh, nucleotides, is made up of nucleotides. Those are the building blocks of DNA, uh, the monomers of DNA. And each nucleotide contains nitrogenous bases, if you'll recall. And they're called nitrogenous bases because they contain a lot of nitrogen. So nitrogen is really important in all, not just DNA, but all nucleic acids, because all nucleic acids have nucleotides as their monomers, as their building blocks. And protein has a lot of nitrogen, because if you'll recall, the monomers of proteins are amino acids. And amino acids contain nitrogen, just like this is ammonia. NH3 here is ammonia. So it can, and it contains nitrogen. So amino acids are called amino acids because they have amino groups that are similar to the ammonia here, NH3. And so nitrogen is really important in proteins. And so these are the two, you know, really important compounds within living things, nucleic acids and proteins. And they contain a lot of nitrogen. The other point is that uh, a lot of the way that nitrogen cycles here through the nitrogen cycle is dependent on bacteria both what we call nitrogen-fixing bacteria and nitrifying bacteria. And there's also bacteria that is uh, called denitrifying bacteria. So nitrogen-fixing bacteria are able to take nitrogen directly from the air and incorporate it into compounds that, can, that are available to uh, photosynthetic organisms, that are available to living things. So you'll notice that the nitrogen-fixing bacteria here, um, some of them are contained within nodules on the roots of certain plants called legumes, if you'll recall, because we've talked about that before. So that's a, a mutualistic endosymbiotic relationship that legumes have with nitrogen-fixing bacteria. Um, a note here, nitrogen in the air makes up about 78% of the air. So it would be nice if photosynthetic organisms could take that nitrogen directly out of the air, but they can't. But nitrogen-fixing bacteria can. So that's one natural way that, ni that nitrogen gets from the air into compounds that plants can use. Uh, another route is by lightning. Lightning, the, the energy of lightning is able to split nitrogen gas, N2, into atoms, individual atoms, and those atoms then will recombine with oxygen to produce nitrate, which is also directly available to, to plants. So uptake by producers. This is the arrow that I'm at to point to here. Uptake by producers. Same as ammonia. Uptake by producers. Right? So ammonia and nitrate and I underline, you know, this is nitrite and nitrate. I underline nitrate here to make the point that nitrate's the important one, that the one that can be uh, directly incorporated into plants. Nitrite needs to be um, turned into nitrate by nitrifying bacteria. So nitrogen-fixing bacteria are making 
uh, nitrogen gas, taking nitrogen gas from the air and turning it into ammonia, which is available to the producers. Nitrifying bacteria are, can take that ammonia and turn it into nitrate, no, I'm sorry, nitrite, and then nitrate, making that available to photosynthetic organisms. You'll also notice that decomposition uh, is part of the process here in both the terrestrial and aquatic uh, part of the diagram. And remember, decomposition is carried out by bacteria, along with fungi. Those are the true, true decomposers, but that contributes to the ammonia in the soil and the nitrogen available to the producers, uh, to photosynthetic organisms. So those are the two natural processes that uh, make nitrogen available to photosynthetic organisms or producers. Lightning and nitrogen-fixing bacteria and nitrifying bacteria. There's also a, an unnatural process where humans are involved that makes nitrogen available to producers, and that would be synthetic fertilizers. Um, a guy named Haber, a, a German scientist named Haber, is the one that uh, figured out the process to be able to do the same thing that nitrogen fixing and, and nitrifying bacteria do and, and we now call it the Haber process, um, where they synthetically are able to take nitrogen gas from the air and make it into nitrates. And, and if you look on any bag of fertilizer, you're going to see nitrates listed as one of the uh, ingredients. So we're adding nitrates to the environment which are great for our crops because we can grow a lot more food. You know, that was considered the green revolution because it allowed us to grow a lot more food. But it also introduces a lot of nitrogen into the environment that wouldn't normally be there. And our crops aren't using it all. So some of it is running off, right? So here, oh, yeah, this just came up just to remind us that this is a mutualistic endosymbiotic relationship here. Um, and then there are also free living bacteria in the soil. That's what these uh, circles are representing, are the free living bacteria in the soil. Um, but back to the runoff. So the runoff, well, introducing synthetic fertilizers is bad. So I added that word bad there. Um, because it's, it's good for the green revolution. It's good for us, but it's bad for the environment. And so runoff is the problem into aquatic habitats primarily. Um, and so if you'll recall, that is the cause of cultural eutrophication. Runoff of nitrates from fertilizers in farmers' fields um, and lawns into aquatic habitats fertilizes the phytoplankton. This circle here represents phytoplankton. You know, the unicellular and colonial uh, photosynthetic protists. And they're, they're, uh, they ha there's an algal bloom, right? This runoff of extra nitrogen causes an algal bloom. And they live and they die and they sink to the bottom. And, they, and the decomp their decomposition uh, causes oxygen to be depleted and then fish die. And so if you'll recall, that's the whole process of cultural eutrophication. And that's a big problem. And it pretty much stems from us adding nitrogen into the nitrogen cycle that wouldn't naturally be there. And, and that, that, uh, the rarity of nitrogen availability to photosynthetic organisms usually limits their growth. But as soon as you add extra nitrogen to the cycle, that unleashes the growth capacity and the reproductive capacity of uh, these photosynthetic organisms and most of, mo of greatest concern are the ones that are in aquatic habitats. The algae and the algal blooms and, and the cultural eutrophication that results. The phosphorus cycle is similar in that phosphorus, if you look on any bag of fertilizer, phosphorus, you'll also find phosphorus listed because phosphorus, just like nitrogen, is a limiting nutrient for photosynthetic organisms. And again, it's found in nucleic acids like DNA. Um, if you'll recall, the components of a nucleotide, the monomers of, of nucleic acids, are a sugar, a phosphate, 
and a nitrogen base. Phosphate, right? Sugar, phosphate, and a nitrogen base. So phosphate is in nucleic acids. And ATP is adenosine triphosphate. There are three phosphates on every molecule of DNA. So, I'm sorry, of ATP. So it's very important to these compounds and other compounds. Phosphates are found in proteins and even um, carbohydrates can, can have phosphates. So really important for life. However, it's a limiting nutrient because naturally it's rare. There's very little in, in the biosphere. Uh, there's very little available, and that's because most, uh, primarily, it, it only comes from the erosion, and then it dissolves, erosion of rocks, and then it dissolves in water, and that's how it becomes available to photosynthetic producers. Um, once it's in the biosphere, though, it can cycle, because producers will take it up and incorporate it into their tissues, and then consumers will come along and eat it, eat the producers and incorporate it into their tissues, and then they eventually are going to uh, eliminate it in urine and feces and decomposition then will make it available in the soil and it can then be up uh, taken back up by photosynthetic organisms so that that's basically a sink in living things um, at, you know so once it enters the biosphere it can cycle through the biosphere but some of that uh, phosphorus that re-enters the soil is going to be uh, is not going to be taken up by by plants, by photosynthetic organisms, so it can become locked up uh, in rock, you know, in sediments that build up over time. And we see the same thing in aquatic habitats. It's a limiting nutrient. It's uh, in the sediments, so the sediments are a sink, and in, in uh, marine habitats in the ocean, that phosphorus can be brought up by what we call upwelling, uh, which are water currents from the deep ocean that come up to the surface, and they bring nutrients up from uh, from the uh, sediments at the bottom of the ocean and make them available uh, to photosynthetic organisms in, in the water. But it's still uh, a relatively rare uh, nutrient in the biosphere in aquatic habitats. And what, but once it's there, it can cycle, just like on in terrestrial habitats. Once it's there, it can cycle between producers and consumers. Um, but some of that's going to sink to the bottom and be locked up in the sediments again until it can be upwelled. And then, of course, just like uh, for the nitrogen cycle, and as I mentioned, phosphorus is part of fertilizers, synthetic fertilizers. So the Haber process and being able to uh, create synthetic fertilizers um, is a bad thing when we add it to, you know, when it gets away from us and, and it causes an increase in uh, phos phosphorus in, in the biosphere that shouldn't be there. That's, that's the bad thing. It's great for fertilizing our crops, but bad for the environment because it escapes into these habitats. And also detergents. And it used to be that detergents contained a lot of phosphate phosphorus or in the form of phosphate um, but those detergents are there have been laws to limit the amount of phosphates that can be contained in detergents so that's not such a, a problem anymore because we realize what was going on and we eliminated that just like we need to do something about synthetic fertilizers and the runoff of those synthetic fertilizers into aquatic habitats that are causing as you know cultural eutrophication so both nit the nitrogen cycle and the phosphorus cycles are related to the problem of cultural eutrophication. And we need to try to, to solve that problem because, as you know, our own Lake Erie is uh, heavily impacted by that. And even the Cuyahoga River that runs right through Kent here.